Great, it started. Great. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining PolicyLink, the San Francisco Financial Justice Project and the Fines and Fees Justice Center for a Cities and Counties for Fine and Fee Justice webinar, Conducting a Fine and Fee Assessment, Part One, Engaging Communities as Partners. My name is Anand Subramanian. I'm a Managing Director at PolicyLink. I'll be facilitating today's webinar, where we'll hear from the following experts from San Francisco and Chicago. Amika Mota, Statewide Policy Director of the Young Women's Freedom Center. Anne Stoldrer, Director of the Financial Justice Project in the Office of the Treasurer for the City and County of San Francisco. Tracy Akami Crowder, Deputy Director of Organizing and Policy at COFI, which stands for Community Organizing and Family Issues. And Rosalia Grillier, Parent Peer Trainer at COFI. Before I turn it over to our experts, I wanted to share um, an overview of what we'll be doing today, uh, review today's agenda and ground us in why this topic is so important and how it relates to the suggested process we lay out in the Roadmap to Equitable Fine and Fee Reform, which you can find at policylink.org. So we'll be doing a welcome uh, introductions and overview then we'll turn it over to our experts from Chicago. So Ann Stoldrer, of course, is one of the partners um, with Policy Link and Fines and Fees Justice Center uh, at Financial Justice Project that started this network. And we'll share some experiences um, with Amika Mota, who is involved with the formation of the Financial Justice Project in San Francisco. Then we'll turn to uh, our friends in Chicago to share uh, some of their experiences from the community perspective about working with the city of Chicago and the county of Cook County um, on fine and fee reform. We'll then turn it over to you for questions and um, comments and feedback. Uh, and I wanted to just note that there are a lot of good ideas and best practices that you all hold in the network. Um, and if you have any experiences you'd like to share, please do put them in the chat. Um, and we will collect those and share those with the network members. So I wanted to reiterate a couple of things from our orientation last week. Um, you might remember this slide overview, with an overview of our goals and expectations. And several of these are related to community engagement throughout the process. So and rel related to the goals, we know that if you want a positive impact on the, on the people who are most impacted by fine and, fines and fees, um, you really need to involve them throughout the process in a meaningful way um, to really know whether there's an impact, how to make that impact, et cetera. Um, and of course, our expectations um, from the network partners uh, include meaningful engagement with impacted individuals and communities um, and process and policy change informed by a racial equity assessment, which we'll get to um, in a future webinar on racial equity that's more specific to that topic. Related to the process, and again, this is in uh, the roadmap for equitable fee, uh, fine and fee reform, um, throughout the process, and there are four stages that we outline, um, there are important ways and uh, ways to engage community. Um, obviously, the first stage, uh, building your team. Many of you already have community representatives on your team, which is great to see. Um, if you don't, or if you want to add more, now is definitely the time to do that. Um, today's webinar will focus on this uh, second stage, engaging community in your assessment. So as you determine what fines and fees folks are feeling in your jurisdiction, um, engaging community uh, to really identify what those fines and fees are and how they impact folks um, is critical. In developing your reform plan, so translating your assessment to the priority reforms you want to identify for the purposes of our work together, um, it's critical to understand how the policies that you want to put forth will actually impact folks on the ground, and that is that racial equity analysis. And then in terms of enacting and implementing reform, there are various vehicles that you might want to employ to enact reform. Some of you may have the power to just change the rules or the policies overnight, which is great, and we encourage that. But really, um, uh, working with impacted individuals, if there are ordinances, laws that you need to pass, if you need public support for those um, new policies, um, obviously engaging community throughout that process is critical. And then in the implementation um, phase, which is ongoing, long-term, 
um, really understanding over that arc whether folks are still feeling positive impacts from the policy change that you're um, working towards in this process and beyond. Um, these are just screenshots from the guide, so I invite you to take a deep dive into the guide if you haven't yet. This again is the roadmap for equitable fine and fee reform. Um, I want to focus on the equity implications of um, community engagement. First, um, we know that to be successful, uh, a foundational element of equity is that the people most impacted by a problem are also the people who have the solutions that can address that problem. And we know that a lot of you have deep equity experience and work well with communities, um, and this may just be a reminder, um, but this can't be about tokenizing people or offering a symbolic seat at the table. Directly impacted people are the only ones who have the lived experience necessary to really understand the breadth of impacts that your locality's fines and fees may cause and how fines and fees may interact with other hardships or opportunities uh, caused by other systems and institutions in your jurisdictions. Another foundational uh, element of equity is that um, the benefits of creating solutions for folks who are most impacted redound to anyone impacted by the issue. Um, and a good example of this, uh, we link to this in the guide, um, is what we call the curb cut effect. And this uh, refers to ADA, American Disabilities Act requirements to cut out sidewalks at intersections so that wheelchairs could pass um, easily through intersections onto the uh, sidewalk on the other side. Um, but one example of how uh, focusing on, on the most impacted folks uh, where those benefits were down to others is that um, folks, parents who have strollers were able to benefit from that. Um, travelers who with, with roller, uh, rolling suitcases were able to benefit from that. So this is just an example of how people who face a problem, in this case, maybe a minor problem for a traveler of being able to roll a suitcase over a curb, um, were able to benefit from focusing on the folks who were most impacted by that issue. We talk about this in the guide as well. This is from the section of the guide related to assessing fines and fees in your jurisdiction. Um, but there are three major uh, ways to engage with community. There are many more. And I just wanted to reiterate too that I pointed to a few ways to engage community throughout the process in those four buckets. There are many, many more ways and community members themselves will have ideas about how they want to be engaged. And so um, a reminder that this is really about um, some ideas and uh, we really want to hear from the folks on the panel, but all of you about other ideas as well. But three uh, ways that we've identified um, that are important to collaborate with folks during the assessment, um, collaborate with the right organization. So really doing a deep dive, um, a real survey of who is actually most impacted and which community based organizations actually represent those people. Um, who, have the, uh, who has the base of people that are feeling um, the, the most impact, who are really directly impacted. So um, an example of what not to do might be if you have an existing relationship with a community-based organization, that's an easy one. You can just call them up on the phone um, and they maybe have visibility, a high profile in the community, um, but they may not be the ones who actually represent people um, who are authorized by the people to represent them in these meetings. Uh, and so um, really doing the important work of talking to folks, understanding what organizations they work with. Um, an important thing that cities and counties can do is to really increase the capacity of the organizations that you decide to work with after you do that analysis. Um, and we talk about that in the guide. I won't go through that now, but please do refer back to that. And um, that may be something that our panelists share today. Um, and then finally, really addressing the barriers so that folks can meaningfully participate. Um, if you decide to do focus groups, if you decide to do public comment sessions, um, town halls, uh, making sure that folks can access that, making sure they're at the right time, for instance, making sure there are multiple times um, in this era, um, making sure that folks who may not have technology access are able to participate in a meaningful way. These are just examples. Um, so for the rest of the webinar, we'll talk about how San Francisco and Chicago partner with community-based organizations and hear directly from a community-based organization um, during their assessments and through other elements of the process. And so I'll turn it over to Anne from San Francisco to share more from that uh, city and county. 
Thanks, Anand, um, and good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for making the time for this. I know we all have um, so much going on right now. Um, you know, I'm as Anand said, I'm going to talk about how we have engaged um, with community groups, with people who are struggling to pay fines and fees uh, in San Francisco. And also just to underscore what Anand said, um, you know, I'm going to be talking about how um, we've engaged community and why it's been valuable to us in San Francisco. We know every place is different and um, I'm excited to learn from from all of you and for the discussions um, that that we're going to have. Um, I wanted to start off um, by introducing um, Amika Mota from the Young Women's Freedom Center. Um, Amika is someone that, uh, you know, we've been working with and learning from for um, quite some time at the Financial Justice Project. And Amika, I, j I just wondered if you'd be willing to um, start us off. Uh, I, I think folks would love to hear you know, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little more about the Young Women's Freedom Center. And if you're willing, if you could talk about, you know, what you see um, with the women that you work with, um, you know, the, what is, how do you see them struggling with fines, fees, um, et cetera, and various financial penalties. And, you know, if you'd be willing um, to, to share your own experience with these. Sure. Um, I just, hello everybody. Um, I'm really excited to join you all. Um, I'm really excited that this um, movement um, to change these practices are kind of um, spreading through this country. It's really exciting. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to join everybody here today and thank you, Anne. Um, so my name is Amika Mota. I am the policy director at the Young Women's Freedom Center. Um, I'm also formerly incarcerated. I came home in 2015. And um, so one of the things I said to Anne when we were talking about this is I, you know, I think it's up on, on the quote, like I, I really don't know anybody um, at the center um, or participants that engage in the program that don't deal with fines and fees. 90% uh, of staff at the center is uh, formerly incarcerated or system impacted. And um, most of our program participants are, are as well. And I really, I, I, it's literally all of us are dealing with this once we've touched um, systems and especially been formerly incarcerated. And so the stories are endless, um, but I, the story I know best, of course, is my own. So I just wanted to um, start with just kind of uh, speaking about that a little bit. So um, I paroled in 2015 uh, with about $12,000 worth of restitution, which I know is we're not touching on that right now, but also um, thousands of dollars in court and fines and fees. And uh, one of the things that came up for me when I was paroling was um, I'd been gone for seven years. I was trying to get back to my children who had, you know, left the area that, um, that I was supposed to parole home to. And so in order for me to actually even be able to be considered for a transfer um, to get to the area that my children were, um, I was told that I needed to pay off a portion of these fines and fees. Um, I'd been incarcerated for seven years. Um, I had nothing. I was coming home to nothing. Um, and in order just to make my way geographically to my children, um, I was told that I really needed to pay off a, a portion of these fines and fees. Um, so I, I was panicking. I didn't, I really didn't think it was going to happen. I didn't think I could get to my kids. Um, but I was able to borrow some money, just enough where the probation or parole said, that's probably enough to make you look good enough for a transfer. Um, so that was just like, that was literally even before I paroled home, that was kind of in the conversation. Um, and then my husband was also formerly incarcerated. Um, I came to a, uh, an urban area, which looks very different than uh, paroling to a rural area, but my husband, paroled home to a rural area. Um, 
he was working in the fields, uh, making about $9 an hour. And um, about a year after he got home, um, we started getting letters from the courts. Um, basically, uh, you know, his fines and fees went back all the way to 2005. This is in 2000. Um, 16 that he came home. So we're looking at fines and fees, courts and fines and fees that were over 11 years old. Um, my husband was earning $9 an hour um, and trying to get back on his feet after 27 years of incarceration in and out. And so it was literally impossible even to, to try to figure out how to pay $50 a month at that point was just literally impossible. So that's just a touch of my story. I, I come into this space with um, the backs, you know, like with the women that I work with every day, the um, young folks that I work with every day, and the stories are endless, but I just wanted to kind of uh, ground us in what I know best, which is my own experience and how it has impacted um, my reentry. Um, Amika, thanks so much for, for sharing that and for getting us started. And, um, you know, it, it really was, um, if you could go to the next slide, Anand. Um, you know, we were, we started the financial justice project after hearing so many stories um, like Amika's. Um, in San Francisco, there was a community coalition um, called Debt Free San Francisco. Um, they were made up of legal aid organizations, um, reentry organizations, housing organizations, um, organizations that work with people struggling with homelessness. And they started calling out um, people, gosh, um, you know, not being able to pay traffic tickets and getting their license suspended and not being able to get a job getting their car towed and the tow fees being so expensive, they couldn't get it back. And then um, that was their largest asset. Um, uh, uh, money bail, um, parking tickets, um, you know, just so many different things. And there was also a very high profile report um, in California at the time called Not Just a Ferguson Problem, that described how about 4 million California adults at the time had had their license suspended, you know, not for any driving infraction, but because they couldn't pay their traffic tickets. Um, you know, and, and it's really hard to get a job if you don't have a, a traffic ticket, if you don't have a driver's license. And um, so, you know, all these, um, this was very much kind of in the media and in the air. And we were looking at this thinking, there's gotta be a better way. We don't know what that way is, but we, you know, wanted, wanted to try. And so, you know, again, I just want to emphasize, we were started in response to community outcry. If you could go to the next slide. Um, so this, you know, again, I just want to emphasize, this was like a very kind of typical story. Um, you know, where we would hear about someone where something kind of small, like pick, making payments on traffic tickets would, once someone was unable to do that, it would kind of spiral um, out of control and into something much larger that, you know, really impacted someone's ability to, um, you know, make ends meet and their livelihood. So, you know, again, I just, you know, want to emphasize that from the beginning, we were kind of founded in response to just hearing about situations like this. So um, if you could go to the next slide. So, you know, Dep Free SF, there was a hearing at San Francisco City Hall. And again, just all these people were testifying, just kind of story after story. And um, I think, you know, the supervisors were hearing this and thinking like, okay, like, where do we start? Um, and so we decided to start a task force. And, you know, I want to emphasize that, you know, I think 
there are a lot of people who understandably are not fans of task forces. <laughs> um, there was even some discussion at the supervisors meeting about that, you know, gosh, we don't want to just write a report, you know, that is never used, <laughs> um, that sits on the shelf. But, you know, we decided, um, or the supervisors did, that this was the best way to start um, the financial justice project. We were just starting and we offered to staff it. So, you know, what we tried to do was get who we thought were the main um, kind of departments around the table and then um, representatives from debt-free SF. Um, so, you know, this was how we got started. And could you go to the next slide? And so then, um, you know, we decided we wanted to you know, do this within six months. We wanted to have six meetings, like a two hour meeting kind of once a month. Um, and we really turned to, you know, folks in the community and debt free SF to say like, what are the biggest fine and fee pain points? And you can see those um, on the right. I'm happy to talk more um, about any of those. Um, but you know those were the topics of each meeting so you know if it was you know parking tickets towing we really kind of before the meeting talked to community groups and you know asked them to present on kind of what how they saw the problem how they saw these issues um, impacting people we would try to look across the country for solutions like has anybody done anything about this um, do think tanks do academics have anything to kind of teach us about this we would often have those folks come to the meeting or call into the meeting um, and we would have vetted um, you know we also would have talked to whether it was the mta or the courts they were at the table and we would try to talk to them beforehand about like what solutions you know kind of do these make sense are these doable for you guys and at the end of the meetings we would put those up kind of on the screen and talk about them and you know see if they were possible and you know we had a always had a good dialogue it was pretty lively sometimes <laughs> um it was interesting the the task force meetings started out small and then kind of more people started coming over time um beyond the folks who were representing the different organizations and departments and we released our recommendations for reform six months later um, at the end of our task force and then um could you go to the next slide please anand so i do just want to call out um and, you know, we're happy to send this to all of you or it's on our website. Um, we put out our report that has kind of what we learned, what our recommendations for reform were from this task force and also describe like how we ran these meetings and um, and what we did. You know, it was interesting, like at first some people had said to me like, oh, it's hard to have like department staff and community staff at the same table um we did not find that to be the case all of the department staff you know liked kind of hearing directly from the community folks um you know i i think that we also were worried like is someone from child support really gonna want to hear about what's going on at the mta or whatever and they all everyone really liked hearing about like each other's departments and kind of what was happening and how they were approaching things so i think a lot of the things we thought were going to be problems um just to be honest really weren't can you go to the next slide please so you know that was really that report was our playbook, I'd say, for kind of our first year or so. And then we, you know, again, just keep, we kind of built these relationships with community groups and departments. And so ever since then, we would hear about challenges from community groups and sometimes other departments and just work with them. And we kind of fell into this role as being somewhat of a facilitator really between what we were hearing from community groups and then helping kind of turn to our fellow departments and the courts and make changes, you know, changes that would make a difference for people and that also work better for what we were trying to you achieve. Baklava or donut? Did you eat breakfast? So um, 
like Amika and I have a meeting this afternoon of <laughs> the SF Jail Justice Coalition, where we're still working on things um, in partnership with the Sheriff's Department. Um, we facilitate a bi-monthly meeting with traffic court because we still have lots of work to do where folks bring up challenges and we work through those. And also with the, the SFMTA, we still are dealing with issues around towing, fare evasion, um, et cetera. And again, just try to have everyone at the table and, and work towards solutions. So, you know, these are some of the things I feel like we've learned. I know a lot of these are very intuitive, I think. Um, just want to emphasize how important it's been us to just listen. Um, and, you know, we don't have all the answers. <laughs> um, I rarely do. Um, I always try to be transparent about what I can do and kind of what I'm going to do with the information. Um, I think our role as a facilitator has a lot of times been appreciated by both folks in the community and um, in the fellow departments. And I just do want to emphasize that for us, um, and again, we kind of um, felt our way through this, um, uh, but, you know, engaging with community just wasn't like checking a box for us kind of at the beginning. Um, folks have really stayed with us at the table, like, and kind of gone the distance. And it's just made the reforms for everyone, like, so much better. So, you know, not only just telling us what's wrong, but what could the solution be? Um, to come into City Hall and make the case um, to other departments or the courts to help us think through how we're gonna implement these things, to comment on what our outreach material or web language are. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from folks how bad our forms are or how poor, you know, hard they are to understand. <laughs> um, and so I've been really helpful in that regard. Um, community groups get the word out. And then if something's not working too, they, you know, can let us know like, hey, I went to the MTA counter and this happened and, you know, and then we, we can, we can fix things. Next slide, please. So I want to bring um, Amika back into this. This is something that we've been working on, um, gosh, for more than a year now, I think. Um, but, you know, I started hearing from folks about you know, how expensive it is um, to stay in touch with, um, if you have a family member who's incarcerated, um, how expensive it is to put money on the books. You know, most jails and prisons in this country um, mark up the prices of phone calls and commissary um, items to generate revenue um, for jail programs. Uh, in San Francisco, what this looked like was you know, if you made a 15 minute call in the morning and evening over what was then a typical 70 day jail stay, it was $300. And the folks who paid for that were typically um, people's family. And in San Francisco, and I think this is pretty consistent around the country, it was typically people's, you know, mother, girlfriend, wife, daughter, oftentimes women, um, usually women of color. Uh, so we um, got to, we were really proud to get to a point where we could make phone calls free and eliminate these commissary markups, but it only happened because we worked um, really closely with, with community groups like the Young Women's Freedom Center and um, like Amika. Um, and so Amika, I wonder if you could come back in here and just talk um, a little bit about you know what stands out in your mind about how we work together what worked well what didn't work well whatever you want to say basically <laughs> for sure thank you um yeah so i think that um we you know we kind of have been building our way up to this point when we got to the the discussion of um you know the free calls and and ending commissary markups um, but what I, I just want to rewind a little bit, even just to the kind of like initial engagements that we had with the Financial Justice Project and Anne and Krista, because um, I think that was really critical um, for 
uh, engaging us like fully in this campaign and um, and then keeping us at the table, like you said, and so I think that um, what was what felt really different about this kind of partnership was, um, you know, oftentimes we are called to the table to kind of share our experiences and um, and. And a lot of the times it's this moment at the table and then we go home and the follow-up isn't, isn't uh, consistent. We don't always know what's going on. Um, and so this partnership felt really different. It felt like um, it was really clear to us that, um, that Anne and Krista and other folks that were at the table that were um, doing all this hard work behind the scenes were really committed to really fully listening to us and to not just have a share experience and then that was our piece at the table but to keep us kind of involved in decision making points along the way um and really like letting us know that we, we were heard and that we were fully engaged in this process and decision making which was was very important for us um and so i think that that you know the relationship from community we, we felt as committed to to you as you did to us just because that the trust was built um and the engagement was consistent it wasn't just uh, sometimes we feel like we come to the tables when we're needed and then and then that's that um and so i think that you know that was a really kind of crucial space of uh, piece of building this partnership. Um, I think that there was kind of this uh, turning point for us and it was so for Anne and her team as well, although we didn't know that at the time, but you know, we'd kind of gone through a number of different meetings. Um, we met with, you know, the, at the public defender's office and kind of talked about a, a number of these fights and what they would look like and you know the idea that it, it's kind of a long haul fight and that it, it, it may not be something that happens quickly um and we moved on to a, another meeting at the mayor's office um and that was a meeting that had a lot of impact on us because we had um it, the, the energy in the room was what shifted. And so I can only kind of speak to what the energy felt like. It was this big round table and you know, there was a bunch of impacted folks there. And um, the stories that folks were telling about what it meant to have access uh, to phone calls were, I mean, we were crying, the mayor staff were crying because it was like, you know, it resonated so deeply with all of us. I, I think as impacted folks to sit there and sit, you know, arm to arm with other impacted folks, like just talking about kind of these horrific moments, you know, we, we had one um, person talking about how, you know, her father passed away um, and she wasn't able to get that news and she didn't have access um, to reaching her family. You know, another, um, person that was at the table, you know, was talking about, you know, they were close to being released um, and were not able to reach out to their family. Nobody had money on the phone um, to, to make arrangements when they were coming home. And so it's stuff that we all understand and experience uh, when we're inside. Um, but to see that the, the pieces started kind of connecting with the mayor's staff at that moment and that they also were impacted by the stories to the point of realizing that some real um, systemic and policy changes needed to take place, um, that gave us some motivation to really push forward and continue. And I also do have to say that we were a little bit skeptical because when it comes to money we feel like that's one of those things that um it, it's it's a harder fight to win when it comes to um messing with the sheriff's money so um so anyhow this was um a, a huge victory for san francisco uh you know women really carry the the burden of these fines and fees um i'm sorry the the, the cost of phone calls and commissary because you can't work in the county jail um, there's also a statewide effort happening in California uh, to reduce fines and fees uh, or to reduce the cost of calls. And we just are really, really excited that San Francisco gets to be a kind of model of what it looks like when we get a win. Yeah, Amika, thank you so much. Um, you know, and I think what 
you know, we did, um, you're right, you know, the money part is, is hard, of course. Um, I think, you know, what the mayor's office saw and what the sheriff, you know, as we kind of worked together over the years was, yes, this practice of marking up phone calls and commissary prices did bring in um, a small amount of revenue, but it was really um, kind of a penny wise, but a pound foolish. Um, all the research shows and from everything we heard from people, you know, the more you stay in touch with your family, <laughs> the better you do, the easier it is to get through jail, and then the better you do when you get out. Folks' reentry outcomes are so much better. So we were kind of shooting ourselves in the foot um you know and so realized you know we need to do everything we can to help folks um stay in touch with their families and we don't want to be gouging um people's families who are struggling to get by in the community san francisco is a very expensive place as you all know um so i think that um we were going to turn to chicago at this point or anand i was going to turn it back to you yeah, thank you so much, Amika and Anne. That was um, really informative. And I'm sure folks have questions or thoughts, so please um, do put those in the chat as they come up. And we'll, we will turn it to Tracy from Kofi. Tracy, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I just want to say that I am very excited to be here. We are excited that Chicago is part of this and um, that our work is uh, being highlighted and that we are able to share today. I also want to start by saying that I think Rose put in the chat box a big thanks to Ann and the treasurer. And so for Chicago, they really were kind of the leaders that we look to. And Rose will talk more about that. But it really, having all of that happen before our campaign started was just such a great help and a way to help guide us as we moved along. So I want to um, do a little bit of a background to our fines and fees campaign, and then Rose will take it from there. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, and our fines and fees campaign is really rooted in a report that the parents did called Stopping the Debt Spiral. Next slide. So a little bit of background about who Kofi is. We've been working for the past 25 years with parents to do leadership development and to support them in making changes at their schools and in their communities and at the policy level. I think one thing that's already been shared throughout this webinar is one of our, the big tenets of our work, which is that parents have to be at the table whether it's a local organization, whether it's in their communities, whether it's at the city, state, or even national level, uh, that parents are the experts. They know what's working, what's not working, and they have the best ideas for how to move forward. And so this is one of the biggest tenets of our work. And I, I'm really excited to hear that uh, this is foundational uh, in the work of this effort. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so Power Pack Illinois is the statewide group of parents that are Kofi trained that are working on a number of issues. So they have four campaigns. Elementary Justice Campaign is looking at the school to prison pipeline and more uh, recently, um, police in schools and addressing that as an issue. There's a health, food, and recess campaign that looks at health, food issues. And this through this campaign years ago, uh, we brought recess back to 
Chicago Public Schools, an early learning campaign that looks to increase access of early learning programs to all communities, particularly black and brown communities. Right now we have an early intervention redlining campaign to look at challenges in the early intervention campaign in, in various zip codes. And finally, the Stepping Out of Poverty campaign, which under which the fees and fines work falls. And I will say that the majority of the members of Power Pack are black and brown mothers and grandmothers. We have a few, a couple dads and, and granddads, um, but it's primarily women in challenged communities. And I keep hearing this word, the center, and the families that we work with are definitely at the center, those who are experiencing the, all the challenges that various systems uh, have presented. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so this is a picture of the release of Stop the Debt Spiral. Um, here we have uh, some of our, our key parent leaders in the Stepping Out of Poverty campaign, along with one of our funders, a university, university staff, and uh, public officials. And the background to sort of how they arrived at, at that point is that Stepping Out of Poverty campaign started out as a uh, primarily aspirational uh, focus campaign. It started out looking at children's savings account as its first kind of initiative to focus on after coming out of the 2008 uh, recession and, and trying to uh, grapple with how to move forward. As parents, parents are very excited and invested in that campaign and, and the uh, legislative work that went into it. But as they started working on it and, and continued on, they thought, wait a minute, what are the financial challenges that we need to overcome first to be able to really take advantage and embrace you know, the opportunity of, of this you know, wonderful instrument of children's savings accounts? And so, they did uh, participatory research, parent to parent, having some very intense and delicate conversations about what people were going through in terms of their finances. And when it came to the rounds of conversations around debt, uh, they interviewed a little over 300 of their peers and family members and neighbors to find out exactly how debt was impacting the families. And I will say that um, in terms of relationship building, uh, one of the tenets of our uh, leadership work is that parents and are, should be building relationships with other parents, organizers with parents, and that the relationships that are built from, with parents and decision makers are so key to uh, really having in-depth work being done on systems change. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so very briefly, I wanna kind of capture what this Stopping the Debt Spiral report uh, revealed. So, what you see on the screen is really some of the demographics of those who were interviewed. And since they were, you know, the, the family members and neighbors of the members of Power Pack, uh, the, the respondents were kind of reflective of, of the Power Pack membership. So it was primarily women. Uh, we had about half African American respondents, uh, half Latin. Tina and other respondents, uh, primarily sort of a middle age group, 31 to 60, half of them single. And as an emerging statewide organization, half of the people interviewed were from Chicago and the other half were from the suburbs and 
down in Southern Illinois uh, where we have uh, parent chapters. Next. Another thing that we found was that over half of the people interviewed made less than $15,000. And a decision was made to focus on how debt impacted this group that is the most challenged. We really wanted to kind of hone in on what that looked like for people and, and you know, as a springboard for what kinds of systems change need to be made, figuring how do we create change that will help that group. Next slide. Okay, so this is um, a slide that took a look at each of the types of debt that people were interviewed about and compare those making under $15,000 to those making 15,000 and above. And kind of looking at, okay, so how do, how do each of these kinds of debt impact everyone? Um, so as you can see, so student loans was actually uh, a, a pretty uh, impactful type of debt for everyone. But what we saw, and you know, Anne mentioned the spiral, what we saw and heard in, in, in the conversations was that the past due bills, the utility bills, uh, hospital bills, the other bills, as well as the past due tickets, that those were the kinds of debt that really uh, took people into that spiral where it wasn't just that I have this debt, but there's these other consequences. And I will say that um, one of the stories that really kind of brought this campaign uh, home for the group was that of a mother who simply wanted to uh, get a small stipend at her daughter's school for being a recess monitor. Um, but when she and she went to apply, she was already a volunteer there. The school wanted her to work there. She went to apply and they told her that she could not work at the school until she paid off her thousands of dollars of debt. And this was a woman who had actually experienced uh, a domestic violence situation and her husband had you know, run up all this debt and gotten all this ticket, all these tickets. And then he was out of the picture. And so she was kind of left in the situation where she was trying to kind of make ends meet and trying to figure out how to piece together a way to actually pay the debt. Um, but here, just trying to participate in her daughter's school, she was denied that opportunity. Um, and so it's stories like that, and, and she actually tried, she went to family and friends, pulled together 500 and had presented it to uh, the city and said, this is what I can start with. But they wanted her to put down half of uh, what she owed, and so it was thousands of dollars, and she just didn't have it. So she was just kind of shut out of the process and kind of had to live with uh, the weight of this death debt for years. Next slide. Uh, so, you know, this slide kind of captures really, so beyond just the financial, like what, what does debt do to people? Um, and so, as you can see, like basically 75% of the people interviewed said they can't get ahead of debt and they can't, and some just didn't even have a plan. Most of them just didn't have it was just so overwhelming. The instruments that, you know, the payment plans, et cetera, they weren't working. And so it was just kind of, you know, the debt is just there and it's insurmountable. Um, and it just, it's devastating. And then what you see is that half of the people say that the debt kept them from moving ahead or had negative consequences. Now having debt, of course, is, is a negative experience if it's not secured and it's not something you know that you can afford. But negative consequences, again, we get back to this idea of the spiral where you start out with a debt, but then you lose your car, you lose your job. Um, and then opportunities continue to kind of disappear the deeper you get into the spiral. And we also found that over half of people had two types of debt 
and a quarter had four or more types of debt. Next slide. Um, and then we just, we talked to people and we just had frank conversations about, okay, so you, this is the situation you're, you're in, but how do you feel? What, what is really happening? And so people talked about, you know, the depression, the devastation, the kind of hopelessness and the sadness, um, and just kind of, you know, the mental, emotional, and even physical health, you know, the, the debt was really weighing people down and uh, really, you know, just putting people in a, in a really sort of devastating state of mind. So that's sort of the background of how we arrived at the fines and fees uh, campaign. And I'm gonna hand it over to Rose. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Tracy. I know firsthand how true those impacts that Tracy described are. I've battled stage four cancer, severe aortic stenosis, and other serious illnesses, but nothing has been more challenging or more stressful to me than the detriment that was caused to my health by poverty and the impact of the imposed inability to overcome and to get out of it, oftentimes as a result of debt or lack of a fair pathway to pay the debt due to add-ons, fines, fees, and other things that keep people from being able to not only get ahead, but to survive to the point that it is causing very negative impacts and that was the outcry in our city uh, from communities, challenged, financially challenged communities such as my own and other communities across the city, but also across the state. But as we dove into the interviews and we started to realize how overwhelming um, this whole thing was, now keep in mind, and I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. As I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of these things are the contributing factors to poverty. Uh, they create an inability for folks to be able to build assets, to be able to save. And uh, in this case, our community, as Tracy alluded to, was really trying to stop this cycle um, of generational poverty and we thought that one thing that could be an attribute would be children's savings accounts. Well, we found out it was very hard for people to save if you could barely survive, if you could barely make it, if you could not get out of debt, there was nothing, you can't get blood from a turnip, so there was nothing to save. Now, let me be clear. We know that this is huge and our goal uh, this is just the beginning because this journey is our hope that will lead us to a financial justice initiative that looks at all of these things. However, you can't conquer Rome in one day. You need a strategy. And we started to be more specific and look at what was going on in Chicago around fines and fees and tickets and booting and the inability for people to even have a pathway to start to address those issues. Folks were losing their cars, licenses were being suspended, which means job loss, which means homelessness, which sometimes meant suicide. And it was so overwhelming to see the ripple effect of all of these things. We said, this might be the best place to start. And so, as a result of that, we started to look at the ticketing and the booting and towing in Chicago uh, directly. Our report raised public awareness. Um, I'm sorry, go to the next screen. Our it's in my heart, so please forgive me. Next slide, please. Our report raised public awareness and led um, to led us to focus on. Uh, and try to target uh, key media partners, 
um, we basically have an initiative for all of Illinois, but in Chicago, this was an issue. So to kick things off, um, we started to address this. Uh, Power Pack basically list, wanted to enlist anyone. We started talking to everyone, and especially the folks that we thought could help us have a business um, and that could make this actually happen with us. And so as the report began to um, enlist certain media partners uh, who started to, to listen to us, uh, we're so grateful to folks like ProPublica Illinois, NPR, and other major Chicago dailies and newsletters um, that started to really get the word out and really share the stories of the folks who were most impacted um, by this. Um, we had conversations with um, the city treasurer, uh, aldermen, uh, different folks in different places and spaces to get in listening ear. Early on, uh, during that time, Alderman Tony folks helped us get a clearer language on the city's websites, just so folks could even know that they had the availability of starting a payment plan. But that wasn't quite enough because we found that some of those systems, although the writing was there, the language was there, the implementation on the ground for folks who had to experience it was quite different. Um, we also reached out to other aldermen to, to, to get their support. Um, we used our stories in keyless meetings um, with aldermen, the Black Caucus, Latino Caucus, to gain their support. Next slide, please. And we did have um, a lot of interest and a lot of folks who would eventually become a part of the, the next, the steps that were to come. Um, we met with the city treasurer uh, and that took us in a different direction at that time than we wanted to go. Um, so we started to reach out to other partner organizations. Um, we spoke about this locally, statewide, and on a national forum to as many ears as we could tell our story to. But then we were met with, um, a blessing from God, I'll say. Uh, we reached out to San Francisco and to Ann and Treasurer Cisneros, and let me tell you how graciously they shared some of, some of their uh, steps and some guidance from the ways that they had done things. Now, Chicago is a different place was our first response. <laughs> Uh, and they challenged us to think about those spaces and places. And I'm telling you, it was most helpful to the rest of our journey. Um, we were then blessed with, through some of our friends, um, WBZ, ProPublica, and other folks hosted an event where it brought together um, San Francisco, I remember Ann was there, uh, and then we had the treasurer on the line, but other folks who were working on this issue and other partnerships that we would later form to really also be champions with us. But the hero was there. Uh, our own city clerk, Anna Valencia, really brought her champion uh, goddess skills to help move this forward. And she joined with Power Pack Illinois to create the Fines and Fees Access Collaborative. Now, with her support and with the support of San Francisco, there was something unprecedented that happened in Chicago that has never happened before in my lifetime. She was able to bring together department heads and let me say again, in Chicago, there is a 
department for every department. And for, for us to see these folks coming into the same room, in the same space, I'm sorry, and have conversations um, with community, with aldermen, with the mayor's office. And the main talking piece in that room was respect. And she set a precedence for that. And it started out, we, we were able to underline some misconceptions, the way that things were written down that they were supposed to work and the way that they were not working for folks in community who were actually experiencing and to have those real conversations and still love each other at the end of the day, I tell you the truth, it was almost enough for me, but not quite. Uh, at the same time, keep in mind, it was election time. And we made sure that we took our campaign to the front line and to the center of the mayoral campaign. And when the new mayor, uh, well, candidate at that time, Mayor Lori Lightford, she pledged reform. She pledged to work with us. She showed that she had a heart for these very same issues. And since then, she has taken a leadership role and helping to move these things forward, I must say. And they are all they were also uh, a part before that and even since then of the Access uh, Collaborative. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. Now, out of our original recommendations, a number of reforms, um, such as lower down payments to start a payment plan have taken effect. Um, consideration for folks who are already below uh, the federal poverty level guidelines were taken. And I won't go through each detail. I want to encourage you all to visit Kofi's website and look at our debt spiral and look at the progress that we've made, uh, Kofi online at Kofi.org, uh, to get the details. But I will say that. Um, the clerk not only broke uh, the cost of the city sticker ticket, which was a big issue, into four affordable, affordable increments so that families who couldn't afford to pay that hundred and some dollars and be in compliance right off were able to then do it in increments and gave them an ability and a pathway to pay. But in addition to that, we also uh, helped with a city sticker amnesty uh, month. And during that time, that very move gave people the opportunity to come into compliance and purchase their city stickers, even if they did it in the increments, which gave them also an additional ability the next month to be able to have their prior fees waived. Now, I know for some folks, it sounds like, oh, okay, but it is huge here. And it is huge for com communities like my own who that debt was crippling. Um, it gave them a pathway. We weren't asking for um, a free pass. We weren't asking not to have to pay our tickets or our debt, but we were asking for a fair pathway to be able to be in compliance and take care of that. Um, in addition to that, I am so happy to say um, that a lot of things have happened uh, in terms of, uh, next slide please, I'll, I'll just wrap it all together. The mayor has also engaged in other services and taken a look at other fines and fees um, that um, would, would contribute um, to these very uh, debt and, and, and issues um, that contribute to poverty. And well, a couple of those things is um, the elimination of library fees. Uh, a lot of, it was causing loss to the city, to the libraries, but it was also causing disenfranchisement and loss to the people. Um, because if you could not pay for 
the absorbent fees that you got for not bringing a book back on time, then people were keeping the property, which was a loss to the city, but then they weren't able to access the libraries and use it. And this was a win-win situation as far as I'm concerned to eliminate the fees, have people bring the items back, but also have folks have access to the library. In some communities, it is the only way that people can use computers. It's the only way that a lot of things happen. And for that not to be present, in our communities was problematic. Also, uh, the end of the water shutoff. Now, this is near and dear to my heart because my mother was victimized in some way. She lost the house to taxes, which we found was a hoax later on, but then they were still charging her a water bill and fees and late charges on top of that until it got to, and she had moved, and I moved her over here, and she had been living here for some years now when we got notices saying that it was over $5,000 in debt that she was expected to pay for a place that she hadn't lived in for years and had shut the water off and something didn't work well. And so we, we, utilize this new thing that the mayor had come up with and i tell you that they were true to their word they took off the fees that were not supposed to be there went backtracked all the way to the original portion where she may have still had some leftover bill set her up on a payment plan to take care of that but another great thing about this initiative is if folks get on the payment plan and they make those payments over a 12-month period on time, it will erase all of the back debt they had. And that is huge for families who are already struggling. In addition to that, we've also been working statewide on the License to Work Act, and it did pass. But this is going to help families who have this debt, but their license was suspended so they can't work so they can't pay debt if they have no means to pay that debt. And I think that um, all of these things work together to a address the real issue here. And that is poverty. And that is predication. And that is building finance on the backs of people who already can't afford to make it. And so let me say, this is by no means the end. Our advocacy has continued, uh, next slide please, has continued around, uh, okay, that's okay, just stay there, I'll deal with it. Um, our advocacy has continued during COVID because as you can imagine, COVID has amplified as well as brought out to the forefront these issues that we have been advocating for all along. And so we've called for a freeze on ticketing, booting, and impounding period during this time. We've also called and won a freeze on utility shutoffs. Um, we're fighting to extend each time that the COVID uh, time frame extends, then we ask for an extension. And parents have been at the forefront of all of this. Uh, next slide, please. Parents have been at the forefront and it is imperative that we use the best practices to keep communities and families and parents and young people engaged, to build relationships with them, to develop those relationships and really hear with the listening ear, um, to give logistical support, pro provide parents with childcare refreshment or whatever the needs are for any given community and then the language be clear section b23 in the interim of section c means nothing to me but if you say we are going to change the dynamics around how we are towing your cars now you got it and i know what that means and i know that's what i need and i can get on board and so we're intentional about explaining acronyms or translating if different languages are, are needed. This is inclusion. Parents have the experience, they are the experts in what the solutions are and they need to be at the table invited and respected 
in a judgment-free zone to hear what they really have to say and have decision-making roles. Parents are the leaders and teachers. So let me close this by saying to you all, this is not over, this is just the beginning. And I wanna give a praise report that says, there is a historic agreement being in the works right now in the city of Chicago that just might be the model for the country around utilities. Our mayor is working with us on some other initiatives around the stop ticketing that might be unprecedented and, and uh, helpful to the nation as we go forth in this. So everyone, I really appreciate all of us being a part of this and sharing best practices and helping each other do this across this country to help those people who want to be an intricate part of society have a pathway to it and let's stop building the country on their back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosalia, and to the rest of our panelists, that was um, really powerful to hear and really appreciate your time, uh, spending your time with us to share your experiences. Before we go to q and I just want to quickly invite Yumi to um, share what you wrote in the chat box very quickly. I think that's an important connection to make uh, in case someone missed it in the chat. So I just wanted to say that I'm just so happy that everyone got to see why Rose is such an amazing and integral member of our team um, from Chicago. But to give a little bit of background on how helpful and instrumental Kofi was, um, back in December of 2018, the clerk called all of these um, community groups working on these issues together to talk about it. And the clerk is a strong believer in community-led change. And so she created that space where she invited um, department heads and she invited members of the community, including Ms. Rose, and she wanted everyone to have um, equal footing and equal say and equal time to speak to each other. And so you had people like Ms. Rose and, and Tracy and Ellen and other members of the Fine Fees and Access Collaborative talking directly to the the head of finance um, and explaining to them what impact the policies were having on them. Um, I was hoping to be able to pull up some of the numbers um, from what happened from our amnesty month, but I can say that um, we were able to forgive over five million um, in, uh, in, in fees uh, during that time. Um, and you can feel free. I, I will definitely correct myself if I'm wrong. Um, and also, uh, we put out a report that had a lot of what um, Kofi had put forth and highlighted in their report, and I will be happy to share that as well. So I just want to say Kofi has been integral. Um, Ms. Rose has been this amazing voice, um, and especially in being able to speak directly to the policymakers so that they understand what the impact is on those who are most um, most impacted by what they're doing. Thank you, Yumi.